when you look at Matthew 25, Jesus said, what you've done the least of these, you've done for myself also, right? Um, and he makes this correlation between being hungry, thirsty, in prison, and being neglected. And then people go, what? What are you talking about? When were you hungry? And when were you thirsty? When were you in prison? He says, what you did not do for the least of these, you have not also done for me. And then he also, then he contrasts. He says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you know, you gave me water, gave me drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. They said, well, when did we do this? They said, when you did this for the least of these. And I think the moniker of a healthy society is how we treat the least of these, whether that be minority, whether that be people in poverty, whether that be people who are working through issues of customs and immigration, how we treat those with the least amount of power is truly a reflection of our Christian faith. Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today I'm joined by a very special guest who's no stranger to the Jew3 Project, BJ Thompson. Welcome, BJ. Thanks for having me, Lisa Fields. How are you today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm glad to be here. Excited to share with your followers today. Awesome. Well, for those who don't know who you are, give us just a little bit of background. Yeah, good. My name is BJ Thompson, um, and I serve as the executive director of an organization called Build a Better Us. Um, we serve both individuals and couples to create products, services, and experiences um, from a Christian worldview so that we can enrich the lives of individuals and couples. Awesome. And you have a new book out. Mm, 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 mm. Two. That's one of that's one of two new Build books. Build a better a better her. Uh-huh. I only have Build a Better Her because obviously I'm a woman. But uh, there's a bit of build a better uh, him. A better him. Yes. It's also one of our other books. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so tell us just a little bit of overview of, about your book to, um, before we get into today's subject matter. Yeah. So we so one of my experiences as I travel across the world and talk to couples and talk to individuals is there's tons of burnout people, right? People who are serving both in for-profit and non-profit sectors of uh, society. And I realize that part of the reason why we're burnt out is because we don't provide three areas of care, self-care, relationships, and our faith. Um, so we created a resource for individuals, either a male or females, to go through with a partner, uh, with a mate, or with a group in order to enrich their lives over 31 days. So absolutely, make sure y'all go pick that up at 31daygrowthchallenge.com. Um, and you can follow me at BJ116 and you hear more about it. So thanks for promoting the book, Lisa. You awesome. And you're telling me relationships just platonic are important? Not just uh, Yeah, they are important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, of course they're important. So yeah. yeah, what are we talking about today on the podcast, Lisa? Tell our people what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about um, minority served versus minority led organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know the difference, what is what is the difference? Yeah, so if you're asking a di distinction between minority-led versus minority-served, typically when you think about charities or non-for-profits, oftentimes much of the messaging, the packaging, the promotion, the marketing, um, and the philanthropy revolves around dark pigmented people. Um, it's people in you know, black and brown countries, inner city communities. And those, though they may be the recipients of goods and services, they are not those who facilitate. And so when we say minority led, we distinctly mean that dollars and charities have to be directed toward those who of are from those indigenous communities. And they're also facilitating towards individuals of that same context. So yeah, what would be your definition of minority-led versus minority-served organizations? Uh, a minority-led uh, organization to me means just what it says: minority-led, minority-founded, minority-run, board, um, okay. all of that led mostly by minorities. Minority-served is kind of um, uh, just an organization out there where they may have a, a few key people to be minorities, but the the organization is really um, tailored and structured by majority culture. Mm, good. So, okay. um, <laughs> why is that important, um, BJ? Yeah, for so I think it's, 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So as we come upon Giving Tuesday and we come upon the end of a fiscal year, um, you know, we often talked about um, equality in a nation. We talk about caring for our neighbors. We talk about some of the things that we're discovering as it relates to how we have structured our society, right? And so I think one of the reasons why it's important to be very specific and intentional about supporting minority-led charities versus simply minority-served is because it can just be something overlooked, right? Um, oftentimes, we support people in proximity because of relationships, because of past connections, because of schools. But our society has been structured in such a way that we live in homogenous communities, right? And so oftentimes, when you think about your friend circles, you think about places where you go to worship, um, most of the time, the people look just like you. And so as we're talking about creating healthy charities within a nation, charities provide and facilitate good works um, where there are lapses in a government, right? And so we'll often say the government shouldn't be responsible for everything. The government shouldn't have to create every program. And I'm actually absolutely convinced of that, right? But the government, um, but charities have to also represent the type of leadership that empowers the people that are being served so that they don't become um, paternalized or um, how can I say this? Um, enable to not ever come to be able to carry out those same things. What would you say? Why would you say it's important to serve, to give to minority led uh, or even some issues that you've seen? Like, man, these are some challenges that I've seen, you know, along in your journey. Go ahead. Um, I think because we know what the issues are in our community. Good. And we're more familiar and we know how to give dignity to that community. Mm. Um, in a way that I think sometimes majority culture doesn't. So what do you I, mean? Well, hold on. What do you mean? Come on, Lisa. This is a controversial, <laughs> so, controversial conversation. Go ahead. Ma ma majority culture often, when they're raising money for minorities, they often are focusing on just extreme poverty, Good. as if they're they're showing a one dimensional aspect, and they really perpetuate the narrative. So they're showing them doing missions. They're holding up a little black baby. Um, they're showing. Um, different things that are just not necessarily promoting or helping the stereotypes that are, are so um, so adopted in our culture. Yeah. And so it's almost like we got to help them because they're not our equals. Good. Um, and so what majority I feel like led organizations like Jude 3 and Build a Better Us um, do is kind of saying, okay, we have... Yes, there are issues in our community, but there's they're not just they're not just issues about poverty. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're not just issues about uh, homelessness. There are issues about relationships. There's in issues um, about intellectual engagement um, that affect every um, socioeconomic class, yeah. not just one. And so I think those kind of things are dignifying, while some other things might just be we have to help them and sometimes it's maybe fueling the guilt a yeah, secret. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's important not just saying people have to support not saying you can't support minority um served organizations but it's also important that you equally support minority led organizations and think through who the board of directors is yeah. and who the leadership is and how is this money being allocated to serve the group? Is it just being allocated in a particular way that doesn't give the people that it's serving dignity? Yeah. I love that you bring that up, right? Because we're talking about test and tried and true. And, you know, when you look at Matthew 25, Jesus said, what you've done the least of these, you've done for myself also, right? Um, and he makes this correlation between being hungry, thirsty, in prison, and being neglected. And then people go, what? What are you talking about? When were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When were you in prison? He says, what you did not do for the least of these, you have not also done for me. And then he also, then he contrasts. He says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you know, you gave me water, gave me drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. I said, well, when did we do this? They said, when you did this for the least of these. And I think the moniker of a healthy society is how we treat the least of these, whether that be minority, 
whether that be people in poverty, whether that be people who are working through issues of customs and immigration, how we treat those with the least amount of power is truly a reflection of our Christian faith. And one of the reasons why I love G3 is that G3 brings such a clarity to scholarship um, through Black academics, through um, rigorous thinking around the issues of apologetics and why it's important to have workplace, marketplace apologetics in 2018 and beyond, right? Um, and creating good work. And, and, and I think one of the things that, that we do as a society is that it's difficult sometimes because we're so bombarded with these messages of degradation, right? We see people running up against the wall at a border and then we're caused to fear that. We see you know, a person that's homeless on the streets and we clutch our purses or we clutch our wallets and as if they're, they're looking to harm us, right? Or, you know, there's been a lot of um, being black at Starbucks experiences or being black at Harvard experiences. And what I'm realizing is that part of that fear has to do with a mislap in our discipleship, has to do with the lack of proximity and has to do with the lack of exposure and experiences to people who are both not just doing work, but they're doing good work in the world. Lisa, have you heard of this uh, documentary called uh, Poverty Inc? Uh, I said, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Got it. So if anyone watching, if you'd like to follow, one of the things that I love about Poverty Inc, they, they basically outline the last 50 years of philanthropy across the world. Um, and they just look at how, you know, we came in, we gave food, we gave water and we gave shoes to these places that were marginalized in third world developing countries. And 50 years later, the people are not more empowered than what, th what they were when we came, right? And I think what it says to us is that our philanthropy, when it's mature, has to lead to the empowerment of those who are receiving. It can't just be that they nurse on us paternalistically and then we feel good, right? but that we have to seek to equip people where they are so that when we come back 10 years later, those individuals are not just someone we give to, but they're someone that we receive from. Yeah, what you think about that, Lisa? The empowerment principle, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's uh, important um, to be, the, the interesting um, thing that I think many people don't realize is that when we think about just American politics, right? There's this pull yourself by your own up by your own bootstraps from more, many conservatives. Um, that kind of say that. Do people still say that? I I mean, some people. Oh, okay. With, <laughs> with that, the narrative um, that they say we need to empower you to build your own um, businesses. That's how a community thrives. But when it comes to philanthropy, they have a more progressive approach. Does that make sense? Mm, no. So what do you mean say, by the progressive approach? They'll say, well, we just, they'll say, we'll give you a handout, but we want empower mm, with charity. Mm, but then when it comes to government, they do the exact opposite. Mm, so it really is a interesting uh, kind of irony there um, that if it, if you push it in one sphere, why does it become insufficient in another? Yeah. Um, so what, what you're arguing for is kind of a thing Let's empower our community um, through giving them um, programs to help facilitate um, dignity, yeah, your own growth. Yeah. Um, so you won't be dependent. Yeah. Um, let's do that. Um, so I, yeah. I think that's the, the interesting way that yeah, and good and good work too, right? You know, one of the things is that there's seems to be this ambiguity around the works by minority-led organizations. And do your research. If you're watching right now, I'll tell you, do your research. If you check out buildabetterus.com, what we do is we empower individuals and couples. We do it both through life coaching, um, through couples, small groups, events and experiences. We have an event called Pursuing the Extraordinary, where we talk about the marriage and relationship from a Christian worldview and how to actually construct those things, right? Um, and then tons of testimony, just breakthrough, right? And so I think even just being familiar with the work, is it good work that you want to have in the world? And to your point, Lisa, I think that there is some cognitive dissonance that's occurring in how we say we give. And 
even as I talk about this, I, I guess another point of challenge for me is how people give to minority-led organizations, right? So as you think about it, minority-led organizations are operational. It's not just an individual, right? So we're hiring staff to create people who are directors over small groups, staff that oversee, you know, our missions on college campuses, wherever, whenever that comes, staff to be able to do that. And so when I ask for a budget, I'm not necessarily, though we'll take a check for $500 or whatever, our budget is $500,000, right? And so what I would also challenge our listeners to do is, as you consider that, right, do your research, but write, write that check, right? Don't be preserving of that check from minority-led organizations, right? If you feel compelled to give that $20,000 check, then make sure, again, make sure the ducks are in a row. Make sure it's good work that needs to happen in the world. But don't, don't make the mistake, and this is what I've seen, where people have to second guess as to whether or not this organization, right, is able to handle those things because they're just another organization. There's no different. Again, we're talking mistakes. We're talking about continuity. We're talking about those things. Like, do your research then, but write the big check as well, right? Don't be so hesitant to write the meaningful check towards that because the works really demand that we get behind it. Anything <laughs> else? What's encouraging? Yeah, I think, I think, think stories? Go ahead. I think one of the things that needs to be highlighted is for minority led, the extra mile that we have to go through. So, oh, um, talk about the extra I was mile. talking go about. Ahead talking to someone who's over a grant program at an organization. And they said to me, this is a real conversation, Lisa, you probably would need to work to prove to the CEOs of this grant um, uh, or this foundation, maybe two or three more years wow. of extra work. But they said, if you were, honestly, if you were a white woman or a white male, they would have gave you the money in six months with no hesitation, but because you're a black woman and you're single, you probably would have to work an extra three years and they would still give you half the amount. And this is a Christian organization. And it shows the, the difference between just the trust they place in minorities and the trust they play, place in um, our white brothers and sisters. Yeah. And so it's almost an inherent trust where yeah. you have to work twice as hard i mean <laughs> i'm that's not even twice as hard no but, that's not twice yeah, that's what is that six months <laughs> two years right yeah that's, that's, like that's way, times to, to not even get as much wow um and so the challenge there is because to be honest there's a lack of trust in minority led organizations good and so if you are hesitant to give to a minority led organization but you freely give to a white organization, then that shows your inherent bias. Wow. Um, and, you know, the number of conversations I've had with leaders that say, oh, listen, with what you three has done in maybe this, the course of 2018 surpasses organizations who who have millions of dollars in the budget. I totally but, agree with that. But yeah. you still would get way less funding because you're a black woman. And so those are the kind of challenges. So that's why we're talking about like the tension between minority led and minority served. Yeah. And if you want great work like this to continue, there has to be a financial contribution that those who are, have benefiting from the organization um, carry with it. Because yeah. if not, there's not gonna be any great white horse. There's not gonna yeah. be the, the great support that other uh, majority organizations may get just yeah. because of the inherent bias that yeah. exists. Let me give you an example of some, some proactive work, right? Of some allies, you know, having this conversation, I think you bringing up the point about the inherent bias and it's the lack of proximity, right? It's the absence of awareness oftentimes. And even when there is awareness, I love that you're making this point sometimes we just reluctant to get there's just no relationship right and so i want to give give our audience some encouragement because i know that sometimes that can be exasperating um have some good mentor colleagues um, and friends who i go i'm not gonna settle for a pity check anymore 
I'm just gonna let you know that. We'll take the we'll take the check, but don't write me your pity check, right? We're doing serious work in the world, and I need you to be real advocates. And and what I've seen through truth and love conversations, right? Um, is that my allies have really stepped up, right? Like instead of playing this paternalistic game of, oh, they pat themselves on the back, you know, they could have gave a hundred thousand, they gave 500, right? Just to feel good and to say they gave. I watched my allies really go to bat to say, no, we're going to, this is going to be what, what my ex pastor would say, this is going to be an ouch check, right? Cause you're gonna give it anyway. It doesn't matter, you're going to clear your books for the year or whatnot. But what I would say is the reason why people should be intentional about giving those checks is so that we can begin to create a society that would be healthy for our children. What do I mean by that, right? Our children are going to inherit a world, right? And we're shaping it right now. We're shaping a world of bigotry and racism through immigration and policy. We're shaping a world of apathy through criminal justice reform and the need for it. We're shaping a world of, um, that lacks medical care for people who can't afford it, right? You and I are creating the world that our children will inherit. And so to lapse either individually, collectively on our responsibility to support those things that would be good for them in the next generation is a, is a misstep and a misstewarding of what God has given you, right? And so what I would say is, there are so many people who desire Lisa, they just wanna hug Lisa, right? The good work that you guys are doing. And I think along with that hug, where there is space and margin to say, we wanna be intentional this year. Again, it's all about intention. If you pick up a book, let me see that book again, The, the Better Her book, pick that up again. Go to A Better Her, hey. right? The A Better Her book. Is just that it's about being intentional, right? Health doesn't just happen through in intuitiveness. It happens via intentionality, right? And so the same thing with building up minority led organizations, you have to be intentional since there is a lack of proximity to those things. Um, and I think because when we do so, we begin to shed some of the bias, right? And the paternalism but then we learn how to love more deeply. And that isn't that the point, right? The point is to never use money to um, create a sense of superiority, to further ourselves, right? Money should be the outworking of what grace has already done in our lives. And charity is just saying, God, this is yours, not mine, right? Um, and that's where I think worship really happens. And so if you're asking me why people struggle with worship and with joy in this season, I think it's partly because of where our money is directed. Mm -hmm. Our money isn't going towards things that would allow us to worship more freely. What do you think about that? Even making the connection between worship and giving. And I don't mean in a forceful, coercive, manipulative way. I mean in its purest form, how grace meets you and then causes you to relinquish those things. What do you think about that, Lisa? Yeah, I think about um, when um, David goes to, um, I think it's Aruna. And they were, he was about to just give him what he needed. And he said, I will not offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. Mm. And it, David understood that anything that he offered to God had to be a sacrifice to him. Wow. So usually when we sacrifice something, it, it, it shows how much we value what we're sacrificing for. Wow. And so I think that is a direct cor correlation. Um, I would also say there are some things practically that organizations need just to be sustainable. And if like you, what? So for a Jew, for example, things that G3 is putting out in 2019, a curriculum. Good. Uh, there will be, uh, we want to get a uh, new headquarters. We want to produce our podcast in, in, in higher quality. The Google, Google Hangouts are good, but we're already um, pricing uh, just to up the quality. We have Courageous Conversations 2019 coming up. Uh, we have a whole host of resources that we want to produce, but these things take finances and resources to do. We we are hiring new staff. Yeah. Um, so we'll have more block 
content. We just brought on another uh, staff person for blog editing. Those are expensive. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you want more blogs from us, uh, we do podcasts, but we're going to produce more content, blog, written blog content. So we just brought on somebody new for that. So um, those are tangible things Good. Uh, that <laughs> that you are giving towards. Good. Um, and the HBCU tour, equipping students. Each each tour stop costs us about uh, anywhere between four to six thousand um, dollars. And so, obviously, I have to raise funds for all of those. So yeah. um, just things that you be thinking through what it takes to do this. It looks amazing, but it takes work to do it. Absolutely. What are some tangible things that people can be giving towards for um, for BBU? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So w- what I'm hearing you say in so many ways is that the work that we do is in magic. It's, there's a lot of work that comes along with it. You know, BBU this year, has we've done major events with speakers all over the world, um, talked to couples all over the nation. Um, we just released a video project um, curriculum that just came out this summer, um, just released two new books. Um, we're planning a tour from 2019 for mental health and care for individuals. And so, yeah, I love that you are putting very serious um, objective things to your budget because that's what you're building, right? We're we're hiring staff this year um, to oversee our small groups. One of the things we're concerned about is the culture of family and marriage. And we want to see an expanded, um, beefed up effort towards being able to give quality care to people across the nation and across the world. And so if you go to buildabetterus.com, go get involved. Our small groups, we plant these all over, right? Um, And so we want to hire staff to be able to make sure that there's quality and integrity as we grow a network of couples who then turn into healthy, right? Healthy couples turn into healthy families. Healthy families turn into healthy communities. And then healthy communities turn into healthy cities, which then in turn create a healthy nation, right? And so what I would say is, again, the goal isn't to um, feel bad, right? The goal is to get excited about something, figure out, okay, is this good work or is it not? But then like you said, you have to know um, that there are real needs and nobody's asking you to give out of, out of this pitiful heart of this. Like you may rob yourself of something, right? You may rob yourself of the joy that God has for you. I think minority, if I could be a voice, I don't like to speak for all black people, but can I speak for all black people in this moment? Uh, I guess go ahead. No, I'm going to, uh, that act, hey, every diversity training I speak for us, I might as well speak for us now, right? Um, (laughs) what I would say, if if I could pinpoint anything, I would say that our nation's racial classism has put minority cherries at a a vast disadvantage. It's made it so that they're consistently the recipients. And then when they need to form something, if it doesn't evolve around the most desperate situations of like water in your mouth, or like shoes on your feet or pregnant teenagers, then it's not treated with a sense of meaningfulness and substantialness. And I think that that is a misnomer. That's a misstep, right? If you're giving to your political party, but you see no value in giving to families because it's from a minority led organization and they're not giving out of the greatest despairs. I think what it says to us is there's a social conditioning that's happened that keeps us from building a healthier society. And so what I would say is the greatest challenge for minority organizations and charities is simply this, the need to have to speak in a way that penetrates the apathy that's been caused through social conditioning. But I think the only thing that can get to that is this, being direct and honest, having your books and business in order, making sure that you do good work. But then also this, creating awareness through the needs that are being spelled out and also creating new visibility with new faces like yourself, Lisa, uh, in the amazing work that you guys are doing. So Mm -hmm. give us a story of encouragement. What's one thing that you go, man, this has been encouraging this year and I've seen that 
Uh, I think encouraging organizations trying to figure out how they can help support and fund um, G3, especially with crisis conversations. Uh, we had a lot of uh, majority culture folks come alongside and support the vision, and they didn't try to change anything about the program. Mm. So I think mm. I was encouraged by that. I've been encouraged by ways in which uh, apologetics organizations um, like RZIM have come alongside to help um, in, in ways of partnership. So I'm encouraged by that. And um, yeah, all of those organizations who partner with us for Courageous Conversations, whether it be in Chris, uh, Chicago Theological Seminary, um, Gordon Conwell, Southeastern, different org schools coming alongside and then partnering uh, for those endeavors, I think is, is important and, and helpful. Good, good. What That's are ways awesome. you've been encouraged? Oh, so yeah, we partnered with the ERLC this year. Um, we did a, a, a venture with them. Um, I spoke at the Marriage and Family Conference this year, amazing time. I'll hopefully I'll post it in a little bit. Uh, maybe the next week or two, I'll put it up, put the talks up. Um, partnering with churches. Uh, we're partnered with, um, we really got to present what we're doing at Emmanuel Church, with Pastor Ray Orland. Um, man, just tons of individuals, all of people you've never heard of before. Yeah. We just said, man, this is great work. We want to come behind it. But we really, again, 2019, we really need your help. Right? Yeah, because and I and I also there. want to shout out the black churches that came uh, 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 alongside, especially Pastor Charlie Dates. Uh, oh yeah, shout out to Charlie Dates. Came alongside in a major way to help with courageous conversations, to give support. Uh, him Progressive Baptist Church to give financial support to Jude Three, the White McKissick Cornerstone in Texas, a host of other churches. My church um, that I attend, Grace Church in Jacksonville. And just a, a, I have donors that attend my church that give monthly. So I'm encouraged by that. So those are some things that have been encouraging for me. Good. Good. I love it. <laughs> and and not only do we want to shout out um, Build a Better S and Jude 3, but also The Witness, um, Truth's Table. Um, Be the what Bridge. Is, be the Bridge, Natasha yeah. Robinson's organization. Yeah, uh, the Ann Campaign. The Ann Campaign. Yeah. Uh, these are all organizations that we know of that are doing amazing work um, and, and trying to be, uh, they are minority-led organizations um, that provide dignity and helpful resources. Yeah. No, that's it. That's amazing. I love it. So uh, make sure you get... Uh, Build a better him or build a better her. A I better say him and a better her. Yeah. I say this all the time. Ju3's growth happens in spurts when when I not focus on Ju3, but I focus on personal development. Whether there's something big happening that I need to career wise that I should be focusing on, but God will maybe pull me inside and say, no, focus on forgiving, focus on reconciling, focus on being a better you. So you have the uh, character to, to sustain the work I'm calling you to. So this is important and vital. Uh, I, I challenge you to take these challenges and support BBU. Yeah. Make sure you pick it up. If you lost the site, don't worry. Um, you can go to 31daygrowthchallenge.com. That's 31daygrowthchallenge.com. Also, I know you guys have a podcast. We do too. Go to the Build a Better Us podcast you can check us out on itunes also we just got on spotify so we're like making it in life right now and um i think we're also on google play so you can check out the build a better us podcast where we talk about relationships spirituality faith from a refreshing perspective with my my side my co-host therapist john a parker so yeah that's awesome that's awesome and you three is on spotify now as well I okay Got to make that announcement. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, BJ. Have a, a, a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show.